talking to you. Hey, can you show us your Bible? Bible. <laughs> Bring it up to the camera so we can see. Oh, very nice. We're gonna be, we're gonna end up muting ourselves because our kids are going crazy. All right, we're gonna get started this morning. We're gonna begin with worship and uh, begin with some prayer. Um, I think everybody got the notice last week, uh, yesterday, that Lynn uh, that Lynn passed into uh, the presence of the Lord. So we're we're still working on the details of the service because Lois and Phil are headed to Virginia to Walter Reed um, tomorrow. Um, so that their son Wesley is having brain surgery, so they're gonna, so they're um, doing that, and um, there are all kinds of restrictions on funerals and memorial services because of COVID-19. So we're not entirely sure um, when the service is going to be. It'll be in the next week or two weeks once they get back from Virginia. So we we have our list of we have our list we email out of all of the you know our frontline folks. Um, uh, you know, people and doctors, nurses, police officers, military personnel. Um, as we as we're praying together, uh, and we're we're entering the the next few weeks will be a real testing time for I think um, the infrastructure uh, as we start to uh, slowly reopen things. I, I know that right now the the plans are for some. Um, uh, some of the uh, some of the areas, not New York and New Jersey, but to start rolling out elective uh, procedures at the hospitals because the hospitals are, you know, we saw we saw this week with CMC and then um, uh, uh, there was another one. I think it was Lowell. Uh, hospitals are furloughing a lot of staff because there's no revenue um, because they're ramped up for this. So as they start to bring people in there's going to be all kinds of concerns of course there's going to be fears there's going to be uh all those things that are going on so let's raise our voices in song this morning <clears throat> let us adore let us adore the ever living god the ever living god and render praise and render praise Unto him, unto him, who spread out the heaven, who spread out the heaven, and established the earth, and established the earth. In, um, in Luke uh, chapter 22, uh, we reread re the familiar words, this is my body, which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. And uh, remembrance, in its usual form, refers to something that occurred in the past that we're recalling to mind in the present. Uh, but in this case, Jesus is mostly referring to what was going to happen in the future, the next day. Uh, when we break the bread and drink the cup, uh, we remember, I, at least I do, sort of mostly remember uh, Jesus's atoning sacrifice given for us on uh, on Good Friday, um, and that is all. That event has always been in our path. But um, and uh, for the uh, disciples, right at that moment, uh, it wasn't. And so, when Jesus says, "Remember me," um, he must have. Um, they must have had uh, some different sort of thoughts that they probably recalled at that time. So I was just curious and thinking about what sorts of things they may have um, brought to mind in that context. Maybe they thought about some of the miracles Jesus did. Uh, the raising of Lazarus had been, uh, you know, done fairly uh, recently, and uh, obviously it was a uh, an incredibly remarkable a miracle even by, by Jesus' standards. And maybe that miracle came to mind. Maybe Philip or Thomas were still trying to figure out what Jesus meant by I am the way and the truth and the life, um, which had uh, been expressed that evening. Matthew might have thought about the party that was at his home where Jesus put the Pharisees in their place while he was sort of, those Pharisees were sort of picking on Matthew and his uh, tax, tax collecting friends. Peter may have thought about 
the fact he just had his feet washed uh, by Jesus, or maybe he remembered uh, Jesus pulling him out of the water when he was trying to walk on it. Maybe John uh, was still preoccupied with the arrangements that um, Jesus had given to both uh, sort of he and Peter to uh, prepare the Seder meal. Uh, maybe he was wondering if he'd gotten the bread and the herbs and, and the wine and oh my gosh, I hope he got enough wine, you know. <laughs> um, but um, ironically, it would be John who was the only disciple who actually saw the uh, Jesus giving his literal body and his blood through that uh, process on the next day. And um, I think it may well have been uh, partly the fact that, um, that John had experienced uh, so much of uh, Jesus' uh, suffering, uh, unlike the other uh, disciples, that um, led him uh, to dutifully sort of uh, ca capture um, all of the things that he remembered that happened um, on that uh, on that Good Friday, Good Friday, well, I'm sorry, on uh, on the Thursday, the night before, um, John recounts uh, five chapters uh, of John uh, kind of happened between when the uh, Last Supper starts and when um, and when they actually go out to the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, by by comparison, Matthew writes just 15 verses, and Mark on behalf of Peter, writes just eight. Um, whatever they, they recalled at that moment, I'm sure it was a, was a personal thing. Uh, the Lord is always a, a, a personal Lord, amen? So um, I, I just hope that while, while I've been sort of talking that uh, perhaps maybe you've thought about what different ways uh, you might um, have uh, recalled the bit about Jesus, uh, both in terms of his, uh, his general sacrifice that he's, he did uh, 2,000 years ago, but also in terms of how he's moved in your life, the way he's um, uh, made, them, made a, a personal uh, relationship with us. So um, I'd like to take the bread and um, just um, this is Jesus' body given for us. Do this in remembrance of him. And uh, likewise, uh, this is uh, Jesus' blood given for us. Take and drink. But I was just thinking about those that have led uh, communion um, over the last few weeks. And uh, it's weird because this, this, it feels so different, right? When, when we're in the church service and you go up front and it's like, you know, it's, it's a big thing. But here, it, it, it both feels more distant and more intimate um, to, to have an opportunity. Rather than seeing Eric from like the back row, you know, we're able to see him right up there. But to think about the background, the, the, the stories of, of everybody that's been leading the Lord's table over the last few weeks. Um, so, you know, I mean, Eric was raised in a, a Roman Catholic uh, home and then joined a Methodist church and then a Presbyterian church and then and is now at Bedford Road. And, and uh, Greg, Greg came from the Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, and and then became a then became a believer and then Bible churches and then the heritage and then eventually the Bedford Road and um, and of course Ray was a Ray Ray was a pastor in the the Christian churches um, and then and is now you know uh, is now one of our elders and um, and Larry of course Larry was in the Navy that's a religion in and of itself um, Larry Buck and and Jim uh, Jim was a chemist uh, you know um, so. <laughs> So, so you know as we as we 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 just kind of walk through you know everybody that's involved in all of these different things there's so many different journeys that people have been so on so here is here is uh the message page um from the website and you can see when you go to the message page you can see 
Um, the most recent sermon in my incredibly um, closed-eyed mug, um, but uh, but you can you can see that the la most recent sermon is highlighted, and every sermon has this discuss button. And when you click on that discuss button, um, there's often uh, questions that I've kind of thrown out and and asked about that, and then some of the background depending because this was the first sermon in a series, I put some background in there. So there's quite a bit of information there. Um, some of the things that I brought up, some of the historical things that I brought up um, and, uh, and then a reconstruction of the ancient city, which gives you a uh, kind of idea. And I mentioned particularly this last week, I mentioned the structure of an ancient epistle. Um, and so I put that in there so you could see, this is how most of the time these epistles were written. Um, and, uh, and the, uh, the names for them and what they represent and all that stuff. Um, and then I had a couple of questions for discussion. Um, and I'm trying to, trying to do that every week, uh, so that we have, uh, we have, uh, um, um, and, uh, kind of something that we can be discussing and we can be rolling over. But one of the things that came up in the email was the definition of, uh, the words grace and, and peace in verse two. And I think it was a great question because um, as somebody who spends, I spend my life studying this stuff, I tend to assume people have the same definitions of words that I do. Um, and this is just, this is true of anybody in a, a vocation. I mean, how many times you sat in the doctor's office and the doctor used a word that to him is common parlance and you have no idea what he's talking about, you know, and you, and so, um, and these are words that grace is a word that is used, uh, a lot, you know, I mean, we use it, uh, right, well, let's say grace, right, or, or um, oh, you know, he was so graceful, talking about a, a you know, a, an ice skater or a gymnast, oh, it was so graceful, you know, so what does, what did, biblically, what does the word grace, what does the word peace mean, and I, and I'm going to put these up with the sermon, um, but uh, I think, I think that Paul, who was a Torah observant Jew, um, and very, very worst in, very, very versed in the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, when he uses things like this, grace and peace, he actually means something more than the Greek word that we read. So, so often you'll hear a Bible teacher, they'll say, well, this is, this is the word grace, and it means this in Greek. Well, remember that Greek is not Paul's first language. Um, so Greek is his technical language, and he's very good at it, but his heart language will always be a Semitic language, Hebrew, Aramaic. When Paul uses grace, and I could be wrong, and he'll probably correct me, but I think when Paul uses uh, grace um, in the New Testament, he is, he is using, he's translating the Hebrew word hesed. Um, and the great definition of hesed is when he who has everything gives me, uh, he, who, he who owes me nothing gives me everything. And that is really the definition of grace. Grace is that God, who has everything and owes me nothing, gives me everything that I need. And so every blessing in our lives is grace. You know, God providing for us something that, that we don't deserve, um, but he provides for us. Um, and so, and, and the, again, the Hebrew word is hesed. Um, it it's, appears in the Old Testament quite a bit. Um, usually translated as loving kindness, but it's also tra it's translated as mercy. It's got a, nobody really knows. We don't really have a word in English to translate it perfectly. And then the the word peace, when when Paul says um, in verse two, grace to you and peace from God our Father. Again, the Greek word for peace, it's it's irony uh, or irony, um, but he's not talking Greek peace. He's talking Hebrew peace. He's talking Jewish peace and in in the hebrew bible in hebrew the word peace is shalom um, and it's the second half of the word jerusalem jerusalem means um, the last part of it is peace and um, people talk about peace they say well it's the absence of conflict peace is comfort peace is a feeling peace is you know are you at peace with something um, but scripturally what we find peace really means is it is the state of comfort that we receive from knowing we are in the will of God. So we can be in conflict and still be at peace. 
you, you can be in the midst of the storm and still be at peace. And, and Jesus even, he uses a moment, he uses nature as, a, as a, a, a teaching tool at one point when he's sleeping in the boat and there's a, a storm raging on the Sea of Galilee. And the disciples are in a frenzy and they wake him up and he stands up and Jesus says, that Jesus says peace. He says, shalom. He calls the world to peace, not because, not because um, you know, it was out of his control, but rather that the disciples need to know that if you're in a storm, what better place than to be than to be in the boat with Jesus? You know? And, and he need, they needed to know he was their prince of peace. So grace, when he from whom I deserve nothing gives me everything and peace, the, the state of comfort in the will of God. And so when Paul greets the church and says, grace to you and peace, he is not granting them something. He is making a statement of reality for them to be reminded of. It's a memorial statement. It's a, it's a statement of this is something you already know. You have grace and peace. And, um, and we, uh, as, as believers, we live... Um, we live in the intersection of God's righteousness and his mercy. We need grace because we're sinners, and we need peace because we are, um, in, a, in a sense, we're trying to live in a world that is contrary to everything that we're trying to be as followers of Christ. And so our forgiveness, our salvation, everything is at the intersection. And grace and peace is what makes us being able to, makes us able to live in the midst of what we live in the midst of. And it is, it is entirely God. And then, and so grace is entirely God and peace is entirely my acceptance that it is entirely God, right? And so that's how we're able to live. So that's, that's why I think Paul uses those words. I could be wrong. I could get to heaven and he could tell me that I was incorrect. Um, and there are, there are all kinds of different, you know, interpretations of those words. And like anything in any language, um, there's something called semantic domain. And that means that a word can be used in a wide variety of things. And grace and peace are two Greek words that I think sometimes are used to translate different ideas coming from the Hebrew coming from the mindset of the, the believer, the disciples, you know, and so, so in this case, I think that's what he means because he's making a greeting, but it doesn't always, it's not always a translation of hesed. Grace is also a translation of some other ideas um, in Hebrew, so is peace, but um, anyway, so that's, that's that, um, and I encourage, I encourage you guys, obviously, I can't get to every question if there's lots of them, but, um, but go ahead, and when you're reading and you're studying, you're going through the scriptures, I encourage you, ask questions, discuss it, dive into it, dig into it, um, have, your, have your thoughts and ideas. Um, and then, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit, um, and I would say write them down, um, because we may not be get them, able to get them all the time, but we're going to hit um, the next few verses in Philippians, and then we're going to, next week, next week we're going to take a few minutes at the beginning, because next week is the first Sunday of May, um, and we're going to take a few minutes um, before we observe the Lord's table, to just kind of reflect on the book of Philippians together. Um, so just like we do our prayer requests, have some minutes to say, oh, you know, hey, I, was, I read this, and I was thinking about this, and, and really give us a chance to, after a couple of weeks to really take some time and reflect on the book. Um, so, um, so I encourage you, well, I'll remind you of that coming up. You know, we'll make sure that we know that, but, but we want to we be, be able to take the time um, to do that. So before we go to the scriptures, before we go um, into the book of Philippians, um, and we start with verse three, uh, I, I'd ask you to just join me with join me in a word of prayer, uh, real quick, um, as we come together and and worship together. Um, and I wonder if Dr. Delisi, if you're lurking there in the in the the weeds somewhere, um, if you'd be willing to lead us in a word of prayer. On just a second, Doc, you're muted. I'll get you. Uh, won't let me unmute you. 
There you go. You're up now. <laughs> Thank you, Father, again for giving us this privilege to be able to gather together, even though we are remote and apart from each other. Your word, your son, is the center of our lives. We thank you for the opportunities that you have presented to us, for the rejoicing we can have, for all that you do on our behalf. Now prepare our hearts to receive from the ministry of your word, the lessons, the insights, and the direction we need to be conformed to the image of Christ. May you be glorified through all that is done in Christ's name, amen. All right, so let's let's take a look at Philippians chapter one and verse three. So this is the beginning of uh, Paul's introduction. He's he's introducing. Um, he's going to He's going to begin by making some personal notes and discussing um, how he's praying for the church. Um, so let's be, just begin in verse three. And this is Paul speaking to the church. Anytime you see the word you, it's plural. So he's speaking to a group of people. I thank my God in all remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. So this is Paul, um, verses, verses three to eight are Paul talking about how he's praying. And verses 9 through 11 will be what he is praying. And I think that he's very intentional. Paul is very intentional um, in his act of thankfulness. And I want to give you a, a, a quick, easy definition of what it means to be thankful. Because to be thankful, we always talk about, you know, oh, give thanks and be thankful. And we tell our kids to be grateful. Um, thankfulness is active gratitude. It's not just, oh, you know, thank you, God, for all that I have. It's, it's thanks that moves me to do, um, to act, to feel, to believe. Um, you know, when Jesus tells the parable of the publican and the, the, the tax collector and the Pharisee praying in the temple, the Pharisee prays a prayer of thanks. Now, he thanks God. He says, God, thank you that I am not like everybody else. I'm so, thank you for making me better than everybody else. That's not true thankfulness. Because true thankfulness isn't, gee, God, you, you've been so great to me. True thankfulness is seeing what God has provided and then doing what God has called us to do with the things that we've been provided. You know, it's, it's, it's moving. It's, it's, um, being aware of the dynamic of what God has provided. And, and look at how many times Paul uses a superlative. I thank my God in all remembrance of you. All right. He says, for uh, always in every prayer of mine for you all. He's constantly, he's bigger. He's, he's expanding his perspective. Um, now, uh, uh, Mike Trask said how much he, he, he sent me a message about how much he loves Philippians. And because, because Paul loves this church, Paul really, really likes these people. And, and he's writing to be an encouragement. So it's not like Corinthians. In Corinthians, he writes about how he's thankful for some of them. <laughs> but then there are, others, there are others he really could live without. You know, and, and, you know, again, you get the letters in Revelation where, where Jesus writes epistles to the churches, and he's saying, you know, there are those of you who have been true and faithful, and then there are those of you who have just been awful or been misled or, or whatever. 
here Paul wants to make sure that the church, they understand he is thankful for them in every way all the time. Um, he is uh, really um, saying, this is, I, I'm thankful for you as a church, as a, um, as, as a group of people, all of you together, um, I, I'm celebrating you. And he, his word for the way that he describes this is that he says he makes his prayers with joy at the end of verse four. Always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy. And you know what? Thankfulness, that active gratitude, all right? Thankfulness has to be done in a spirit of joy. And, and joy is not just happiness. Again, joy is, is, like we've talked about with all these other things, joy is an acknowledgement of what God has provided and how what God has provided for us brings me joy. I choose joy. And, and I think that's important, that, that point there, although it's, it's kind of out of the scope of the scriptures that we're actually looking at. But you, you have to choose joy. You can't wait for joy to hit you. All right? You can't sit around and go, oh, I'm just going to wait until God makes me joyful. You have to choose joy. And you know, it, it's, it's tough when, when you go through life and you face all the difficulties and challenges. And I mean, look, you know, I, 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 the, 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 the lock, the, the, I keep calling it the lock up, not the lockdown. Um, but the, but this, this whole thing that's going on where we're all having to stay at home and work at home and drive each other batty, because as much as we love one another, you know, it's good for us to have space from time to time, you know? Um, and, <laughs> and we're all, we're, you know, we're kind of squeezed together, and you have to choose to find joy. You know, sometimes you, you've got you've to you've sit there and go, I am not going to complain about this. I am not going to gripe about this. I'm going to accept this as a blessing from God, and I'm going to be thankful for it. I'm going to choose to be joyful about this. Um, and, and that's tough when you have to um, choose to be joyful in your expression of thanks to God for something that's difficult. When, when you have to look at the physical problems you might be facing or, or the financial issues that you might be challenged with or the spiritual struggles— and say, you know what, as hard as it is, I'm going to choose to be joyful, and I'm going to give thanks for this thing, for this moment, for this challenge. It, it's not fun. It's not fun to wake up in the middle of the night with, in pain and, and not say, you know, you, you go through your lament, ah, I'm miserable, ouch, I hurt, oh, this stinks, I really wish this wasn't going on. I'm sure no one has that problem at all. None of us are dealing with that at all. Um, but, but then to turn that and say, but, but I'm, I'm going to rejoice in the Lord. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to be thankful for this. And so did the Philippians have problems? Did the church of Philippi have issues? It, they definitely do. And Paul will address those issues. He'll address the false teachers that are trying to influence them. But he starts with, let's be joyful. Let's, let's thank God for what we have. Let's, let's celebrate this thing. And what does he celebrate? In verse 5, he says, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Now, I think this means that um, the two people we talked about from Acts 16, Lydia and the Philippine, Philippian jailer, who the church was worshiping in their homes in the book of Acts, I think that means that he's got them in focus. He's looking at a lifetime of ministry to those people and those households that were there from the beginning. And he says, look what God has done. Look at the amazing things he has done. And the partnership, the Greek word is koinonios, all right? It's, koinonia is fellowship, oneness, unity, shared commonality, this thing we have in common. He says, we are partners. We are, we are in communion in the gospel from the first day. To the last. Um, my wife and I, because we've, and, and I'm not picking on her or anything like that. She hates when I use her as an illustration. Um, so I'm not using my wife as an illustration, okay? Um, but uh, 
when we first started dating, we've been spent, we, we've been, we've been together. We were, we were doing the math and we, we've been dating for, for 24 years. We, we started dating in 1997. So we started dating in 1996. Um, and, uh, and then we, we got, you know, we went steady or what, I don't know what it was. We were, we were in a Bible college. Things were nuts. Anyway, we got, we got engaged and then we got married and, and all those things. Um, and we were talking about, we, I was clean. I'm cleaning my basement to to uh, to um, not lose my mind, right? So so I'm cleaning my basement, and I found um, this folder of all of the notes that we sent to each other in college. So they were in with my school notes, you know, my school books and everything. And um, they weren't lost; they were filed. Um, but they but they were they were in with all of my all that stuff. And you know, open those up, and and as as young people I mean she was 18 when we started dating I was I was 20 and um and one of the things that that I recall and it, it's such a joy for me to go back that that one of the things we just decided very early on and not that we've done this perfectly but we just decided that what we would do is that we are our unity our fellowship our friendship and our dating relationship and our marriage would begin by us giving everything to Christ giving all of our love to him and then allowing him to love the other person through us and just saying, you know, we're going to just love the Lord and, and we're going to love the Lord together. And we believe that God has brought us together. And so, so he's going to help us to love one another. And over the, you know, now two decades, and I know we're still newlyweds to some of you. Um, but, but, um, but, uh, and Doc and Loretto newlyweds to us. Uh, but, but the, uh, all the way, all the way through this whole thing, you know, we've been able to, when we had trouble or struggles or challenges or difficulties, to be able to go back to that and say, yeah, but this isn't about us. This is about Christ. Our partnership is in him. Our partnership is in the gospel. And so that gives us a foundation for joy that fuels thanksgiving for who we are no matter what we're going through, whatever difficulty. And this, again, it's not to brag about how our marriage is perfect and all that stuff, but rather to just remind us that when we start with the foundation of a partnership with Christ, in Christ, then we can always go back to that. It, it can always be, we can always have a foundation that we can take everything down to the bare bones and say, but, but Christ. And then be willing to, if we need to rebuild what may have fallen apart or broke or, or wasn't clear or whatever, we can rebuild that thing on that foundation of Christ. And so when Paul says in verse six, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you um, will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So this verse gets pulled out of context sometimes and people go, well, God began something with you. He's going to finish it with you. You just have to believe. He's actually talking to the church. So, so I think that we, we have to take this in the context of what's being said first, and then we can draw principles out of it. What Paul starts with is we were in a, we're in a partnership. We're in a commonality of the gospel all the way back. You know, two, two decades ago, when this chart, church started in Philippi, we decided that was going to be our foundation. And now God is at work. And the church of Philippi is dealing with a difficult time. Again, we're dealing with false teachers. We're dealing with issues. So he says what God has started. And Paul doesn't say what I started because he doesn't give credit to himself for the beginning. He's just a participant. He's just a partner. He's just uh, he's a partner in the gospel with them. He's not the key. He's not the linchpin to the gospel. But when he says, when we go back and we see what the gospel did and what it's doing, and we look at the difficult time that we have now, we can have a confidence that what God did, he's going to bring it to completion. He's going to bring it to perfection. He's going to bring it all the way to the day of Jesus Christ. Now, what he means there when he says the completion at the day of Jesus Christ, really interesting aspect of Paul's theology that, that I'll hopefully be able to expand on this week and, and post some stuff. Paul has this belief that the longer you live and minister, the, 
the closer you get to the day of Jesus Christ. Now, he believes that ultimately the day of Jesus Christ is the, the return of Christ to rule and reign. Um, and people ask me, when is that going to happen? And, you know, we all, we all have the prophecy discussions, and, and you guys have all heard this from me. I believe Jesus is coming back. The details are fuzzy. So, so I, I'm okay with that. Um, and, but I believe that that, so we, he has that in focus, but he also has in focus. Paul writes, he says, at one point he says, I'm in a straight betwixt two, whether to stay, which is good for you, or to go and be in the presence of the Lord. He, and I'm paraphrasing him, but Paul's, Paul's point is either Jesus is coming back or I'm going to Jesus. And that's when the completion will be. That's when the perfection of what I'm doing and what I'm involved in, and what God is doing. That's the end game. That's the end game. Um, and we, we know you don't retire from being a Christian. You, you don't stop. You don't stop growing as a believer when you reach a certain age. It's not like Social Security. It's not like you hit 65, and you have achieved, and now you, you know, now just the checks of Jesus stuff come to you. you you're continually growing. You're continually maturing. Um, the founder of the martial art that I do, uh, Morai Weishaba, on his deathbed said, this old man must train. And it, this idea that, that you can always get better, you can always improve, you can always do more, you can always serve. And why are we doing that? Not because of an obligation we have, but because we're partners in the gospel from the beginning until the completion of Jesus Christ, uh, of the day of Jesus Christ. I think, and this is my opinion, my, my pastoral opinion, I guess. Um, I think there would be a lot less conflict in the church, big C, if we took this lesson to heart. And, and as followers of Christ in various churches, denominations, flavors, sizes, shapes, and all of those things, if we took this idea that we are partners in the gospel because of Christ, um, and and I, I don't I, I'm I'm not trying to to be critical, but but this this crisis, this COVID nineteen thing, has done a couple of things in the Church of Christ, and I use Big C, not not Bedford Road, but the Church of Christ. We've discovered as a church just how much, and I want to be kind, just how much we waste on our own legacies. Because the churches that had the big whiz bang and the hoopla and the and the suddenly that's gone, and they're discovering and and I know this because I get all these messages and stuff from organizations. They're discovering that when people come to church for hoopla and whiz bang, guess what they don't do when you're watching church on Zoom. You don't give, you don't attend regularly, because you're paying for the hoopla. You're you're paying for the party. We. What am I getting out of this? If I'm, if I'm watching a TV monitor, a monitor on my computer, what am I getting out of this? This isn't, you know, I, I, but, I, but I'll pay if I, if I can go to church. And people are discovering, oh, wow, people, we thought that people were, were, you know, were doing one thing and they're actually kind of thinking a different way. They're kind of thinking like consumers. And I'm really interested to see how the church evolves. Again, big C, at the end of this. Because will we go back to the old routine? Will the church continue? Will the, the church growth publications still continue to push all these business models? And, 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 you know, I mean, somebody said, I was talking to somebody um, and I posted on Facebook, I got a couple people, including my cousin upset at me because I said that, I said that churches should not be participating in the uh, Paycheck Protection Act from the government. I, I, you know, I was like, look, I, and you guys know me, I'm total separation of church and state. I just, I just don't believe the government has anything to do with the church. The church had nothing to do with government. We're not a, we're, we're a kingdom to ourselves. Um, a kingdom to Christ, actually, not to ourselves. But, um, and somebody said to me, they said to me, well, you know, but, but churches, a lot of churches, they operate, you know, um, they, they just operate from week to week. How are they going to pay their staff? How are they going to do this? I, and, and I know I'm cold and cynical at points. Um, but I said, don't you think you should have planned for that? Isn't it, isn't it just as biblical to plan and budget and be wise stewards of what God trust, entrusts you? You know, 
do we need to spend all the money that we spend? And I think it's going to be a really interesting transition. Again, we, the big C church, not Bedford Road. Um, it's going to be a really interesting look at the church as we have to recover from this. And there are a lot of churches, a lot of congregations in the world that literally can't operate. They spend every cent that comes in on things and stuff and staff and, and, and they run debt. They run debt margins on the idea of cash flow. Those of you that are in business, you know what cash flow is. Money comes in, money goes out. And they operate on the idea of, well, there will always be more money. There will always be more money coming in. So we spend money anticipating that that money will come in. And you got to ask yourself whether that's biblical, but we won't get into that debate. Um, but what Paul says, and the argument that Paul makes is, really, if we're going to deal with issues in the church, if we're going to deal with a, a worldwide plague, if we're going to deal with this, what is the foundation of who we are as a church? And he digs it down. He says, we are partners in the gospel from the beginning to the completion of Christ. And so whatever God is doing, we can go back to him and we can trust in him. Did we know, uh, and the elders will tell you we did not know, that we were going to get hit with um, two months plus of doing church on, on Zoom, all right, of people not being in the building. And guys, this building is so empty. <laughs> like, this is, it's so empty and and i find myself uh, we had the security cameras installed and i'll actually pull the app up on my phone just to see if a car pulled in you know but i just i'm just i'm like did anybody show up um and tom tom Hathcote needed a place to work on friday just to, to work from home and i said well work downstairs just to have another human being in the room, in the building to yell to, you know, hey, how are you doing? You want lunch? You know, kind of, it was just like, just to, just to have something going on that wasn't being in my house or taking my dog for a walk. You know, it was, it's, it's going to be great to be back together. Did we know this was going to happen? No, but the elders will tell you, we sat and I constantly said, we have to have a reserve. We have to have a cash reserve. We have to, what happens if everything falls apart? Because you know, this, if the, 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 the COVID thing breaks tomorrow, right? If suddenly there's a miraculous cure and everybody, they just spray from helicopters and vaccinate us all, right? Even if that happens, there are, what, 20, 30, 40 million unemployed people in the country now? The, 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 medical, the medical profession has been destroyed by, by, by this, I mean, it's going to take a long time for them to recover. I mean, you know, retail, we're going to see all kinds of major retail uh, outlets that, that are, we're barely holding on to the threat are going to be gone. They're going to be unemployed people everywhere. And it's going to affect us as a church for a long time. And so we, as a church, we had, we planned not for this, but we planned for something. Why? Because we want to be together as partners in the gospel from now until the completion of Jesus Christ. Now, let me just throw this out. That is in no way, shape, or form a plea for money, <laughs> just in case anybody's worried about it. You guys have been unbelievable during this. Um, you can look at the email and see we have met our budget. We have, we have another surplus. We're going to be able to put money into the building fund. You know, it, it's, it's extraordinary the way that you guys have done this we were able to we were able to pay for the security cameras to be installed which we were going to do next year we just paid for it just we were, we had a surplus to be able to cover it and have the building set up i mean it it is you guys have been amazing you continue to be amazing and i and i if i can say this without bragging about you guys i think it's because ultimately when it comes down to it this is what we've tried to be We've tried to be partners in the gospel from the first day until the completion. We're in it to do what God has called us to do as long as we can, as strong as we can. Um, I wish I could come up with a third word to rhyme with that because it would have been cool. But um, we just, you guys have done amazing things um, in this time and continue to do it and continue to show up. And there are a hundred of you on Zoom right now 
being a part of this worship service, which is extraordinary. Um, there's 50 devices. I went through and did attendance. Over 100 people have gathered together with us, especially if we include the Gilmans that like doubles it. Um, so, uh, but we, you know, we uh, thank you so much for being partners in the gospel. Um, so here's what I want to do. I want to close with, a, with a, a, a song of prayer. We all know the words of it. It's going to sound absolutely awful, okay? Because I want to unmute everybody. And we're going to sing the doxology together, all right? So it's going to be terrible, but not as bad as a birthday song. So we're going we're gonna to go ahead and do this. So Ariel, go ahead and unmute everybody, and we're going to sing the doxology. Praise God Praise <laughs> <laughs> it was awful.